every day, you and I get bombarded with negative news. And just like our bodies becomes what we eat, our minds become the information that we consume. If you want to stay positive, it's so important that you also listen to stories that inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we interview world-leading experts dedicated to solving the world's most pressing problems. And if you stick around, I promise you will not only be as informed as if you watch the news, you will feel uplifted, inspired, and have more positive energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Hi, and welcome. Today, Great.com talks with Benjamin Strauss, who is the CEO and chief scientist of climatecentral.org. And if you haven't heard of them before, they are an independent organization of leading scientists and journalists who are researching and reporting facts about our changing climate. And if you haven't already done so, you definitely want to press subscribe because today we're going to talk about climate change, maybe rising sea levels and what the recent political development in the US might mean for uh, the effects on the climate and the US rejoining the Paris Agreement and all kinds of fun stuff. Benjamin Strauss, I'm really excited to speak with you today. Emil, thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. Right. And before we begin, how would you describe your organization to someone that might not be so familiar with what Climate Central is uh, doing? Yeah, so we, we our, our mission is to make accurate and effective climate change information ubiquitous, so that enough people care enough about the climate problem to drive action that rises to the challenge, that meets the level of the threat of climate change. Uh, and we combine science, storytelling, and technology to produce um, scalable solutions to, to drive a very high volume of effective and accurate messages through a lot of different channels. Okay. so. You want to get more people engaged and want to do something for them to change their habits or be involved or somehow care more about the climate. What ways of accomplishing that have you found the most effective? Yeah, so I, we, we're certainly interested in people changing their individual behavior, but we think it's very important that institutions change and governments change. Um, this is I like to think of climate change as the easiest hard problem. Hmm. It, right? We're not going to solve poverty. We can make progress, but we're probably never going to solve poverty or cure all disease or have justice for absolutely everyone or end inequality. But we can solve climate change. We know exactly how to do it. And the key problem is deciding to do it. And so that's why our strategy focuses on communications. We see communications and persuasion, education of people as to the real danger of this threat and its meaning for them and the real possibility of solution. Uh, we see that as a real common denominator approach. Uh, if you forgive the pun, it's a rising tide that could lift all boats, or it's a strategy that kind of fertilizes the soil for all kinds of efforts at different solutions, right? You don't have to be a climate expert to understand that helping to educate and energize all kinds of people in all kinds of places and organizations, all kinds of countries and governments, we need that level of everyone effort, right? At a high level, honestly, for decades, um, but the good side is we can do this. We know exactly how to do this. There's an end point. Um, and so that's, you know, you don't, you don't have to be an expert to do our, well, we have to be an expert, right, to share accurate, reliable information. But um, someone interested in getting involved in climate work who hasn't done it before and, and um, 
might be thinking of different approaches or organizations, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to decide that it's, you know, it has to be wind or it has to be solar or it has to be nuclear or whatever. Helping, you know, publics and leaders to um, grip onto this and put more energy into climate is just kind of a no-brainer from our point of view. Um, and we, you know, we, we use a whole lot of strategies to make sure that the way we're, we're really, our strategy is a force multiplier. Um, we're not so much looking for the people who very much want to learn more about climate. I mean, we're, we're certainly interested in those, but we also want to make sure to reach people who have just a little interest or maybe are in the middle on the fence. So we're not looking for people who are necessarily going to beat down our door at climatecentral.org. We want to bring our messages to where people are, and we want to deliver them through um, messengers that people trust. So we tend to work through um, other or through journalists, local journalists who are highly trusted, TV, online, through other organizations. We build tools that others can use, and so it's kind of a double force multiplier strategy. We build things so that, you know, personalities on TV can talk about climate with confidence and effectiveness and their audiences trust them. Um, so that's, and, and, you know, the elements of effectiveness include not only a trusted messenger, but delivering local information, personalized information. And one of our big strategies is delivering that at scale. Um, so even in the communication space, there are a lot of groups who um, may have a national campaign. They have a, a kind of particular message they want to get to everyone and they buy an advertisement or they kind of work in the national media or the global media to try and get that particular message out, which we think is very important. But our strategy is more focused on how can we get the same kind of information out, but in a thousand different ways, each of which is tailored to the local place where it's going. So um, when we do our research on how climate change is changing the weather, we get a result for every media market in the United States. And we deliver that to the TV personalities in that media market at the right time so that they can put it on TV. Or when we do our sea level research, um, we produce maps that can be localized any place in the world. So in India, when, you know, a, a user, a journalist can go on our maps to Mumbai and take a snapshot and put that on TV or in the news and say, look, here are the stakes of this global sea level science or of choosing a high emissions, high pollution pathway versus a low pollution pathway. Here's what that means specifically for Mumbai. And so, you know, using visuals and making it local and find it using technology to find very efficient ways to do that at scale, that's kind of the secret sauce. That is what makes Climate Central, in our view, quite unique among all the groups working on climate change communications, um, let alone climate change more broadly. I really enjoy your way of thinking that you want to empower people to communicate better by giving them these tools. And I see how scalable uh, your solutions are. And you, with so much knowledge about communication, which I hear from the way you speak, I guess our listeners are interested in understanding what can they do to convince people around them to be more mindful of the climate? Or rather, what should I not do? Maybe, I guess people are they really want people to change around them, but they don't want to become this doomsday, you know, the world is going under because that shuts people off as well. Yeah. How can, how can our listeners, you know, reach people around them? Well, the, the first thing I want to say is that that's a very important question uh, because I often get asked, what can I do about climate change most broadly? And of course it's valuable if people, you know, change their light bulbs to LED and they, they use mass transit or they, they get an electric car. They, 
They do all kinds of personal things. Those are all good. But personally, I think this is a problem that calls even more for force multiplier strategies. So I encourage people to think about the different communities they're part of and what role can they play, you know, helping to change their whole family, not just them or the school where they, that they attend or the company that they work for or the local or national government that they um, are part of or live underneath. So to me, you know, communications is essential. And I think in terms of how to be effective, it, it starts with knowing your audience. Um, I agree that a big gloom and doom story is generally not going to be the ticket. Some listeners may be interested in a kind of sober explanation of different, different facts. We, we find what tends to be most useful is to explain the local impacts of climate change. That what does this mean for the places where we are or that we care about? What are the changes that are already happening that you can see with your eyes? And so when you focus there, there are a couple of um, important advantages. One is it's not this overwhelming global doom story. It's about a specific change or projection right in the place where you are. It's much more manageable and so the mind doesn't shut down, but it's also, and, and it also tends to be smaller because the biggest effects are usually going to be someplace else or farther in the future, or if you add things up globally. So people don't shut down as much. It's more of a practical kind of roll up your sleeves problem. And um, we also like to, you know, keeping it in the present, right? It's, it feels less speculative if you can talk about trends that have already happened or how the current weather and impacts are changing. Um, that's useful. And then it's very useful to talk about solutions as well and the local dimensions of solutions, what, what, what that would mean, um, what that could look for. Because the fact is solar and wind energy is now basically equal to or even cheaper than most forms of fossil fuel energy. There's, we can do this. We really, we really can do this. It's gonna cost a lot less than we think and it's going to create a lot of opportunity for people. So th there's a very positive bright side of you know, innovation and change. And um, you know, I think of Europe, there are gonna be so many what we call co-benefits. Um, in Europe, I think of these wonderful old cities. And one of the things that I used to always think was a natural part of these cities was basically the kind of dark sooty like coating over all of the old statues. But that came from decades and centuries of coal smoke and car exhaust wow. and diesel, right? Like once we switch to electric cars and clean energy, those facades need to be cleaned one more time. And that's it. They'll stay clean. Like when it stays, when, when it snows in the winter, the snow will stay white. Like it won't turn like gray and brown because of all the diesel exhaust and, and all of the um, coal plant exhaust and all those sorts of things. Um, the streets will become much quieter and more pleasant. So there's all kinds of things you can talk about. Um, and, you know, for, if you're talking to a real contrarian, I find that the best approach, if they're really dug in, is not to like get into a fact against fact argument, but to ask them to find a way to have them do a self-examination. So, you know, I say, well, it looks like you like to think for yourself. Like, yes, of course, you know, and not follow the mob or what you think everyone is saying. That's right, I'm an independent thinker. Good, that's a good thing. But surely there are cases where you would agree with the majority, right? Or where you would agree with the majority of experts. Like, you, do you agree that smoking causes lung cancer? How come you agree with that expert conclusion and not the expert conclusion on climate change? Like, what leads you to accept some scientific consensus and not other? And people are totally unprepared for that. So that's, that's a pro tip. Wow. There was at least seven pieces of gold in that answer. 
I really take with me how you live by example, by painting a picture of we can do this and hope in what you say. You're very specific and you're using metaphors like the statue. It's stuck to my visual senses. And um, yeah, understanding how to reach your audience as exemplified in your last example was uh, beautiful to listen to. Let's switch topic a little bit because I am so curious to understand how will it change like the before the US election and this was this was two weeks ago so I'm very excited about it and I was nervous before because it seemed like such a fork in the road like one way where it this was my feeling body speaking it feels like we are going to a place where we are just gonna destroy our planet and another way was okay now we are nurturing our planet and this is just my personal opinion of course um, but what what is really the difference here in uh, when the US joins back in the Paris Agreement? What does it mean for our client climate? Well, I, I think um, the results are look like they should be quite important for our climate because, um, you know, President-elect Biden was part of an administration that did a lot of work on climate, the Obama administration that was a leader in uh, you know, it, it seems to me, right, in the discussions that led to the Paris Agreement, there were many other leaders too, but it was important that the United States was there as a strong voice. Um, and so that's going to return, right, someone who is right, right there. Um, I, I couldn't blame um, other nations for kind of continuing to be worried about exactly where the United States is, right? If we flip flop from one place to another and back, you know, what, what's the future going to be? But I think we have to work with where we are right now. And even though um, the control of Congress in the United States is not clear yet, we're going to have a president who understands how to get things done on climate even when Congress is intransigent, because you know there was no climate legislation under Obama, but that administration figured out how to do a huge amount using the executive branch of the US government. They figured out how to do a huge amount on climate and Biden was there for the whole ride. So he's gonna have a real jump start um, if, there is resistance from Congress, even if there is resistance from Congress. But an interesting thing in America is that um, there is some partisan division on climate, especially when you look at our elected leaders in Congress. But when you look at the public in surveys, there's a pretty big difference between Democrats and Republicans. But still, like a slight majority of Republicans favor action on climate and a strong majority, a good majority, it is very much in favor of clean energy um, amongst Republicans. So also, if you look at surveys um, by age, for younger Republicans, there's very strong support on climate and clean energy. So it's a bit of a generational thing. I think the party is going to have to change. One of the tragedies in America and in the world is that this is a partisan issue. I kind of feel like um, I'd be delighted for the parties to have, for the political parties to have big fights about what we should do to address climate change, but we shouldn't be having fights about whether it's really a problem. I kind of think of two fire chiefs looking in a building with smoke pouring out of the windows. They shouldn't be arguing about whether there's a fire. And that's what's happening now. It's okay for them to argue about what strategy they should take for putting out the fire. But I would also add that that argument should be very efficient and fast so that then they can begin implementing the strategy. And that's where I hope we can get in this country. I do see, you know, there, there's evidence that um, Republican um, legislators, you know, in quiet back rooms, like they, they like tuck in pro-climate provisions when they think they can do it very quietly. Um, and 
you know, I should also circle back to, you know, at Climate Central, one of the things we do, we, we are not political, not partisan, uh, not even advocacy. Our strategy is to really put out very credible, rigorous science-backed information that can be put on the news in any newspaper, you know, on any TV station. And I'm proud to say, for example, that our climate contact, uh, our climate information and graphics goes out on all kinds of local TV stations owned by Fox News and owned by other um, media networks, which tend to have very conservative and Republican sympathies. So we're on TV across the spe ideological spectrum in the United States. Uh, and um, I should add that we've done, you know, peer reviewed research showing the effectiveness of the way we communicate, the communications that we drive, and that shows that it appeals to audiences across the political spectrum and basically reduces the difference in their viewpoints on climate change. So that's a big part of what we try and do is make sure that this is uh, an issue that people can engage with across the ideological spectrum, whether that's in the United States or internationally, uh, frankly, when we make it local and specific and tangible and visual, that really cuts, um, it cuts through ideology, right? We all live in, in the same city, right? If we're back in Mumbai uh, and like we have to figure out this problem because the water is getting higher. And when we wrestle with that very local problem, we see that this is real um, that it's going to require, that it's going to be expensive. Um, and we see that we can make it much more manageable by cutting our emissions. And we have to take action on both fronts, really reducing the emissions and also planning for higher seas and more climate impacts. So that's, you know, all tightly connected to the kinds of strategies that we deploy. We are coming up towards the end of this interview, but I'm really curious to ask this, uh, ask a question about the rising sea levels, mostly for selfish reasons, because I'm unaware and I would like to know, like, what does science says? How much is the water going to go up? And uh, how is that going to look at? And if you can give a little bit of a more brief answers, because we're running out of time. Um, yeah, so, um... There are two different time frames really to think about. Um, we sea levels will go up, you know, between the year 2000 and 2050. It's a pretty narrow range, uh, probably on the order of 30 centimeters, you know, plus or minus 15 centimeters. Doesn't really matter what we do. By the end of the century, we have much more diverging paths, and it's much harder to know, you know, 60 centimeters to two meters. Uh, it depends on how much we pollute, but it's also really hard to tell. In the long run, we know we're gonna see a lot of sea level rise, right? If I dumped a truckload of ice outside your house, like you would know immediately whether it would melt and how much would melt, right? It's all gonna melt because summer will come, it's all gonna melt much harder to say, like, how much is it melting per minute, per day, exactly when will it finish melting. So we're already committed to basically two meters of sea level rise in the future. I can't, if we stop polluting tomorrow, and I don't, you know, it could take hundreds of years for that to arrive, but when we go into the next international discussions, you know, one of the things we'll be doing is showing pictures and visuals and maps, even like Google Street View type images, but with floodwaters that are scientifically based, um, that show, you know, here's door A, here's door B, right? If, if we cut emissions, here is the sea level rise that we are basically locking in. We are signing up for this legacy and all of our children remember us versus door B is, you know, a much higher sea level or a much lower sea level that we sign up for because it, it takes time 
for the ice to melt and to catch up for how much warming we've already done. Um, and the choice that we have is really the difference between being able to hold on to most of the great coastal cities in the world uh, versus not being able to hold on to any of them uh, in the long run. And what will our descendants think about us depending on which of those choices that we make is a big choice in the legacy. Mm. Yeah, that is, um, that is worth reflecting on. Right, so there's a lot for me to reflect on. There was so many excellent metaphors you used in the way to explain climate change. And I just want them to soak into me so I can tell them to uh, the next person. But let's say not that someone is listening to this and they feel uh, inspired. They want to learn more about climate change. Uh, maybe they want to follow your organization or maybe even do something to help. What can someone do to help out and stay informed? Well, um, with respect to us, um, please come over to climatecentral.org. You can sign up for our newsletter. We are, you know, we mostly work through um, media. And if you want to become a, a partner, a financial partner, you know, in our work, um, we are always looking for more allies. Um, we've got very exciting programs uh, coming up, um, you know, more research on those rising sea levels and developing really cool visuals of what's behind door A versus door B at scale. Um, very powerful, proven approaches. We've been doubling the work, basically doubling the impact of our work with local TV meteorologists who are some of the most trusted voices in media in the United States, doubling the amount of our content that they're putting on TV every year for three years running. It's now kind of thousands of TV spots per year. And there's a lot of room for growth in that program. And then our most exciting project right now is leveraging both of those programs. And the sea level work, by the way, is completely international, not just US. But leveraging both of those, we're, we're building a sophisticated software system that essentially is tracking weather, um, coastal water levels, a huge range of climate impacts and solutions like uh, renewable power generation. We're tracking all of those data in real time and that enables us to identify like the exact moment in different places when something notable happens with respect to climate change so that we can then automatically assemble a miniature media package and send it to journalists in that geography. And also make it available for um, NGOs, um, researchers, uh, government officials. They can get alerts or social media or uh, data through an API, which basically says, hey, you know, the weather you're experiencing today or yesterday or even in the forecast tomorrow like that has a link to climate change and here's the story here's some of the science here's the facts here's here's uh some visuals and language that you can use and helping people to deliver that kind of information at exactly the right moment in exactly the right place through all of these different messenger pathways it's immensely scalable we're building it right now for the us but something that we um, have some of the research pathways going to make it truly global um, and just see that as a real force multiplier strategy. So, you know, we very much um, invite your listeners to come check us out at climatecentral.org. And frankly, you know, if not us, there are tons of other organizations um, and inspiring groups working on climate change. I've had a chance to describe a bit of our unique niche of developing these communications at scale efficiently and then delivering them through effective messengers. But there are lots of other approaches and ways. And frankly, kind of, as I said at the start, this is a really big problem, but it's also a solvable one. But as big as it is, 
it's going to need all of us. Each person has their own contribution to make based on their own life, their own circumstances. And the important thing is that each of us, you know, reach down until it, even the point that it's a little bit hard, maybe, and you're a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit outside the comfort zone, and take action, do something, and try and change your communities as well as yourself, um, your family, your school, your company, um, your government. That's how we're going to get there um, through that kind of commitment. Hmm. Beautiful. I feel uh, inspired to get started. Ben Strauss, thank you so much for taking the time to speak in with Great.com today. I highly appreciate your time. Emil, um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And for you listening, if you felt like this was inspiring and uplifting and maybe you learned something, I would, we would really appreciate if you would press the subscribe button in your podcast app or on YouTube. That will greatly increase our chances to be shown in different top lists and be recommended so more people can hear these kind of conversations and make positive changes in their lives. So thank you so much for listening and we see you in the next episode.